hard to know this morning whether it's best to wear my glasses or not. When I wear them, everything's fuzzy, and when I look at you, you're fuzzy. So. <laughs> so we've just come through a very long, cold spell. Uh, you guys have lived here much longer than I have, but for, for me, I think it's the longest cold spell that, that we've lived through. Uh, parts of our house, like our kitchen and our entranceway, aren't very well insulated. And we've had the thermostat turned up higher in our house than we've ever had it before to stay warm. Scott put a glass of water at the bottom of the basement steps last week, and in a few hours it was frozen solid. That's in the house. Last Monday, two out of three vehicles didn't start. And last week, we had a hot water pipe to our dishwasher freeze. First time in 15 years that we've lived in that house. But there's still lots to be thankful for. Remember a few weeks ago, back in January, when the power was off for 26 hours? I was very thankful that that didn't happen now. And I am thankful for a warm house. I'm thankful for vehicles that just needed a boost. I'm thankful that that water pipe didn't freeze or didn't burst. So much can happen that is beyond our control. And you've probably seen uh, pictures from the disaster in Texas the unexpected cold, when they talk about this, this deep cold and they're talking about just a few degrees below zero, very different from us, but the disaster that has caused from a few degrees below zero, burst water pipes, damaged homes, and the people have been without power, or were, were without power for a number of days. No water or the water that was there was bad. We depend on water, we depend on electricity, we depend on heat, and we take it for granted. And when we don't have it, our, our world, our life is upended. A number of months ago, I read an article that said, science says we need at least four basic elements to survive, water, air, food, and light. And when you think about it, these four elements are very important to us. We can't survive without oxygen. We need water and we need food. We need the light of the sun. The sun is exactly the right distance from the earth to give us the warmth that we can survive. And it's interesting that our creator God provides all of these elements for life, and in a deeper way, he provides them in Jesus. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. Last week we heard Jesus say, I am the true vine. I am the vine, you are the branches. And there's a branch attached to the vine. He's our source of everything we need. Today we want to look at another statement that Jesus makes that reveals more to us of who he is. This time he doesn't say, I am. So two weeks ago we talked about the Feast of Tabernacles, a seven-day Jewish festival at the end of harvest, and they celebrated God's law, and they renewed their commitment to God, their covenant. And we talked about the illumination of the temple ritual. They would light four big lamps. It was a reminder to them of God's light and God's promise to send his light, his promised Messiah, into the darkness of our world. And Jesus was standing near the lights when he said, I am the light of the world. He was claiming to be God's light, God's Messiah. And the people were shocked. And he was challenged on his statement. But it said many put their faith in him. And we saw the light at work in the life-changing encounter of the woman caught in adultery. So another ritual at the feast was a water ceremony. Every morning, a priest would blow a long blast on the shofar and another priest, carrying a gold water pitcher, would lead a procession down the stone steps to the Pool of Siloam, either to the pool or to the origin, the origin of the pool, which was the Gihon uh, stream. I read in, in several places it said the pool, other places it said the stream. The crowds would wave palm branches. And at the pool, the priest would fill the pitcher with water, and they'd all chant, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. You heard that scripture from Isaiah read earlier. And they'd walk back through the water gate to the temple. And the priest would be joined there by another priest who was carrying a container with a drink offering of wine. 
And the shofar was blown three more times, and then the two priests would walk up to the great altar, and together they would pour the wine and the water out on the altar. And then other priests would march around the altar, praying, Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. There would be a time of silence, and the people would reflect on their desire for personal and spiritual refreshment. Only God's spirit, symbolized by the water, could satisfy their thirsty souls. And it was a rich symbol, and they would remember back to Exodus 17, where Israel is traveling through the desert, and the people are thirsty, and there's no water. And God commands Moses to walk up to the stone at Horeb and, and, and uh, strike it with his staff. And water came out, and the people drank, and God provided. And there are numerous references to God's blessing of water and rain in the Old Testament. Isaiah 44, verse 3, God says, I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. And Jeremiah laments that the people have forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water. And now the Jews live many years later under Roman rule. And the water uh, ritual is a symbol of hope that God will come again. And once more he will pour out this living water this life-giving spirit on his people. And this ritual of going down and filling the picture uh, was repeated for six days, and then on the seventh day, it was repeated seven times. And as I read that, I thought, wow, I thought of, uh, of, Jer of Jericho and them, the Israelites going around the city of Jericho seven times. So now I want you to imagine with me the seventh time on that seventh day. It's the last and the greatest day of the feast. Jesus arrived at the feast, as you heard a little bit later, kind of keeping to himself out of sight, although when you read through the chapter beforehand, you see that he's in a lot of dialogue with religious leaders and with the people. He's watching the ceremony and everything that's happening with others. And at some point, I would expect towards the end of that seventh time, he stands up and he calls out in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let them come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within them. We're used to hearing that statement. The people of that day would have been shocked. They know what Jesus is saying. They know what it means. Jesus is saying that he is the fulfillment of God's promises. He is the promised one. He is the Messiah. He is the source of water for all who thirst. And John tells us that Jesus is referring to the Holy Spirit who will be poured out on Jesus' followers on the day of Pentecost. And some of the people immediately respond, and they say, surely this man is a prophet. Surely he is the Christ. Others, they can't put the pieces together. Just doesn't figure out right, and they don't believe him. So what does Jesus mean when he says, if anyone is thirsty? Let him drink. Come to me and drink. Well, living water refers to water that moves, water that flows. It's like a stream or a river, water that's fresh and water that's clean. But Jesus isn't referring to physical water. Water, as I mentioned earlier, is an essential element of life. Jesus is an essential element of life. He's essential to abundant, everlasting life. He's referring to new life in him, to the fullness of life, that can truly satisfy. Not just water that quenches our thirst for a period of time and then we need to have another drink. But the Holy Spirit who will fill us, who will flow in us and will flow from us, will always be with us. 
Is anyone thirsty? The psalmist eloquently expresses this thirst. He says, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. And Jesus is inviting uh, all of us to satisfy our thirst, to find what we're really hungering and thirsting for in him, in knowing him. And of course, you have to be reminded of the story of the woman in John chapter 4. Jesus says that he has to go through Samaria. You may think, why? Because there are other ways that he could have traveled from Galilee down to Judea without going through Samaria. But Jesus has a divine appointment with this Samaritan woman that day. He's weary, he's hungry, he's tired, and he waits as the disciples go to get them some food. And as he waits, a woman comes to the well to fill her pitchers. And Jesus asks her for a drink of water. And she's surprised. As we know, the uh, Jews and the Samaritans didn't get along at all. Men didn't talk to women, for sure in public, and in, or unless you were, the, uh, you were his wife. She's an outsider. She's marginalized. She comes to the well at noon to avoid other women. And she questions Jesus. And Jesus responds to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would have given you living water. And she doesn't understand. I mean, we wouldn't either. Jesus doesn't have a pail. He doesn't have a rope. How is he going to get water? And besides, the water in a well may be fresh and clean, but it's really not living water. It's not flowing water. The well is deep, but she's curious. She's drawn in by what she's hearing. And she's wondering, where can I get this water? And Jesus respond, responds, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. Hear that? Again, we hear living water. New life fullness of life, eternal life, not just water, but the very life of Jesus himself within us. And by this point, she still doesn't understand, but she wants it. This sounds good. She won't have to come to the well again. She'll be able to avoid people even more than she did before. This would be great. But Jesus doesn't leave us, and he doesn't leave her where we are. <laughs> he's not finished with her yet. He continues to draw her out, out. He hears what she's really hungry for, what she's really thirsty for. And she, he, she, he gently continues to draw her out. He gently probes her to admit her dark secrets and her sin. And then Jesus reveals himself to her in a way that he has not revealed himself to anyone else up to this point, he tells her that I am the Messiah. I'm the only one who can give you what you long for, that living water. And this encounter with Jesus brought her freedom, a new life, and her shame is gone. This woman that wanted to avoid people now runs into the village to tell those who shunned her, their, her neighbors, the good news so that they can know Jesus too. I've always loved that story. These verses just impacted me so much as I looked at them again in context with Jesus' words um, at the festival, at the feast. I don't think I'm the only one who longs for something and doesn't always know what I'm longing for. Don't think I'm the only one who feels dissatisfied and longs for more. I daily pray, O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. There are so many things that can get in the way, that can make us busy. But Jesus is the only one who can truly satisfy. 
And he comes to us and he says to us, if anyone is thirsty, let them come to me. Let them come to me and drink. And like the Samaritan woman, he'll gently probe in our lives. Those areas where we, where we are filling our lives with things that don't really satisfy. And he will reveal our sin. And as we respond to him, he'll set us free. And deep satisfaction, like an ice cold cup of water on a hot day, is found in him. He'll fill us anew with his Holy Spirit as we drink deeply from him, as we take in his word, as we hear his voice, as we see him in the beauty of creation, as we see him in those around us, and as we live in the abundance of who he is. The water I give you will become in you a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. As we are renewed, and as we are filled more and more with the Holy Spirit, our whole being is flooded with this life-giving water. And the Holy Spirit will guide us in God's ways. And we will know Jesus and his power in our lives even more. And this flowing stream that is within us will flow from us to those that we connect with, those we serve, those we witness to. And it's God's compassion and his love, and his kindness, and his gentleness, and his mercy will fill us, and it will flow out of us as a spring of living water to those around us. The Lord will guide you continually, giving you water when you are dry, and restoring your strength. You will be like a well-watered garden like an ever-flowing stream. Is anyone thirsty? Do you want more? Jesus says, come to me and drink. Let's pray together. Father, I'm so thankful it doesn't matter who we are or how good we may think we are. But you continue to work in our lives. You continue to show us those areas where, <laughs> where darkness reigns. You continue to draw us to yourself. You continue to make us more like Jesus. Thank you, O oh God. Lord, as you did with the woman at the well, you continue to probe in our lives. And Lord, it hurts. There are many times that it hurts. But O oh Father, you continue to love us and you continue to lead us. And what a joy it is to be forgiven, to walk with you, to be filled with your Holy Spirit to share the joy of your salvation with those around us. Lord, may we more and more recognize the hungers and the thirsts that we have as hungers and thirsts that can only be satisfied in you. We'll turn our hearts and our minds even more and more to you. Thank you for the families that you have blessed us with, the children, for the work that we have, for the friendship. You are so good, oh God. You are so good. Continue to speak to our hearts. Continue to draw us more and more to yourself. And oh Lord, we look forward to that glorious day when we will finally be known as we are known, when we will see you face to face. What a joy that will be. Thank you that you go with us as we head out into this new week. Lord, I pray again that we will have opportunities that that living water will spill out around us in our work, 
in our friendships, our, 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 uh, as we are with other people, we will have opportunities to share the love and the joy that can come through Jesus Christ with those around us in our words and in our actions. Father, as we have been, a, as you have blessed us, may we be a blessing to others. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Song of response. We're going to sing like the woman at the well. we leave this place refreshed by the living water that Jesus offers to us. May, may we be a well of hope to our thirsting neighbors, an oasis of opportunity to all those that we encounter. Go in the blessing of the God of life, the Christ of love, and the spirit of grace. Amen. <laughs>